Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Um, I come from this place in Africa, Nairobi, Kenya. It's called Kibera Slam. It's one of the largest slums in Africa, and this is the place I call my home. My name is Joshua Ogure. So in 2009, uh, Kibera was like this, and this is it's a huge slum, an informal settlement. And the government didn't want to consider it uh, a place where people should be living because it was actually a forest and people encroached in, into it. So it showed like this in the government map in 2009, a blank spot. And this kind of triggered us and we said we felt so marginalized, we felt so neglected, we felt so forgotten. And we said, how can our home, a place we live, be represented as a blank spot in the government map? We have to do something about it. So 13 youths representing 13 villages started mapping using a GPS gadget, walking from one place to the other, collecting uh, points of interest, mapping schools, shops, uh, hospitals, anything they felt were of importance to them. Uh, and putting this map data into the OpenStreetMap. OpenStreetMap, I believe most of you know, is like a Wikipedia of map where anyone from anywhere can contribute. And it was interesting because people from the local Kibera community, youths from Kibera, Slam, themselves, collect this data and upload them into the open street map because these are the people who live there and they understand their areas, they understand their challenges, they know their problems, and they know the changes that takes place. And for the very first time in 2009, we produced the first digital map of Kibera that looked like this. It had a lot to show uh, shops. Uh, all those data that they were collecting were on that map it kind of became so congested for people to, to, to read and analyze and see some of these things. Then we said, what can we do about it? We decided to break it down into different thematic areas and we ended up having a health map, security map, education map, and water and sanitation as per what the community members prioritize, because we called a meeting to just try and find out what were some of their interests, what are things that they would want to be mapped for them. And after mapping this, we said, what, what next? We have mapped Kibera, produced the first general uh, digital map of Kibera. We've broken it down into different thematic areas. So what, what next? Uh, we decided to, to bring in an idea of citizen journalism. So we started Voice of Kibera, a platform that will let people report about issues happening in their communities. It's an SMS reporting platform on Ushaidi, crowdsource. So those red balloons are reports coming from different regions, different parts of Kibera. And the reports are categorized categorized into different categories. Is it a health-related report? Is it security-related? Or is it education-related? Or security-related? So that's what we did so that people could get a platform where they could get information from and also report to the world. And then we went ahead to introduce video platform called Kibera News Network. This again, would give people opportunity to speak about issues affecting them, to speak about some of the issues highlighted by the map. If the map shows that we in Kibera doesn't have a public hospital, for example, and we have so many private hospitals, which means they are expensive for us, and we are citizens, we pay taxes, we need government services. So people use the, uh, the maps to argue and advocate for their rights. 
and say, look, this is what we are talking about. And we record them on these cameras, little flip, handheld flip cameras, and we tag the government or people we feel are, are responsible or responders or policymakers for action. And we've been doing this a lot and training more uh, Kibera youths to be able to report about their own communities. And we went ahead with schools and started something called Open Schools Kenya. It's a website. And this uh, was meant to make education information easily available, accessible, and useful to everyone. So again, we would update the education information we had mapped before and went ahead to build this website where each and every school now has a profile page. Those green balloons, if you click one, you can be able to see how many, uh, uh, how many students are in that school, how many teachers, how, how much they charge, uh, what's their contact information, who is the head teacher, and all this uh, information that people would want to know about a particular school, all the programs they do, and all that. So, and even we collected pictures, we took pictures of the school, so a parent, for example, can be able to, to tell how a school looks like, can have a rough idea and make informed decision of where to send their children to, depending on their capabilities and also preferences. Capabilities because they can be able to check at how much a school charge. Uh, preferences because they can have look at the pictures and decide and see. So those in, that information is down there and they can check plus all the contact information and all that. And we did something called data interoperability. If you check, check at uh, this, you can see what the government had collected way back in 2007, like has never been updated. So you can check what we collected on OpenStreetMap and just hit compare to see what has changed since then. And then we did something interesting we printed the maps and distributed them to each and every school we had mapped. And for the first time, Kibera community were really happy that at least someone is giving them the product of the data that was collected from them. Uh, Kibera is one of the most researched uh, places in the world. People come and go. A lot of researchers come, students and all this. But they really never get to see the result. So when we gave them back the map, they say, oh, Map Kibira, this is amazing because so many people have come here to collect our data, to take our information, but we've never seen something like this. So they were very happy to, to receive the map and even to, to be able to identify themselves with it, see their schools and point, point, point them on the map. My colleague Zach was even walking around with a laptop to try and show schools how they can be able to uh, use their school profile pages. Some wanted to use it for fundraising purposes, some wanted to just advertise themselves, but some were just happy to be on the map or on the website. And this is our late member of parliament, uh, Honorable Keno Koth, uh, was a big supporter of education. He passed uh, last month of cancer, uh, and uh, people really were not happy because he was a big, uh, a big man in this education sector. He helped a lot of people. So he used our maps a lot and even used the website to create our, our WhatsApp group for schools, for teachers. So he would communicate easily with them, organize uh, meetings, share opportunities and all this. And even the government officials, like this is sub-county director of education, uh, she used our maps a lot and did uh, photocopies to share with other people and even get to know how she can reach out to uh, other schools. We did some offline strategy, just painting maps on the walls and trying to, to reach those who cannot access internet easily at some strategic positions where people pass so they can identify themselves with it and even see what they want to see. So this is what I wanted we have moved from uh, uh, Kibera and gone to other informal settlements. This is uh, uh, Baringo County. So this is where we are now doing open county mapping for accountability and service delivery. So these people are residents of a very remote area in Baringo County. And they are meeting to decide what projects they want their government, regional government, to implement for them. 
So we are partnering with World Bank to try and help them map their projects. We use the youth insight there to, to, to map the projects so that during these meetings, they can be able to, to, to see, check them up and see what we already have before even we decide uh, what we want next. So we, we have been training county governments, officials plus the youth in there to learn how to map using GPS, uh, ODK and COBO and then putting them onto the open street map. So, so far we are doing Baringo County and McQueenie County. And youths are excited to learn new tools on how to map their projects that then can be, uh, they can be able to use during participatory budgeting. The World Bank project is called participatory budgeting, where members are empowered to decide what they want in their respective counties. So people moving around with uh, ODK, GPS. GPS is mainly because of the accuracy. We've been using it a lot, but now we are kind of moving to ODK uh, and COBO because the accuracy of some phones have really improved. And then they edit them onto the open street map that, that then later produce a map, a large map that people can sit around and see what projects they have. And they can say, oh, now we have a hospital, now we have a school, we need a market, for example. And this is, uh, we have also built this website for them. So this, uh, these are two different wards in that McQueen County. And someone can be able to click a project, for example, and see even the picture and see the budget, how much was spent on it, and see the status, you know. Uh, is it complete? Is it in progress? Or is it not yet started or stalled? And they are categorized into different departments. We have uh, transport projects, we have devolution, we have agriculture, we have health. And you can uncheck all any of those and just, if you just want to see the health related projects, you can uncheck the rest and just remain with the health related. If you want to see education, you can uncheck all those and just remain with the uh, education alone and see what the counties are doing uh, with their different projects. So that was McQueenie and this is Baringo, the same. We are mapping them and we are moving to other counties and then we later produce a map like this, uh, it's not so clear, but we produce a large map and then a list of projects that people can then check during these participatory uh, budgeting meetings and decide what next they need uh, for their respective counties. This is just the, one of the team we trained uh, in Baringo County. And we are still moving. We have 47 counties uh, in Kenya. We have just done two, and we are slowly moving to the others. So yeah, thank you very much, and yeah, thank you. Questions are welcome. Yes. <laughs> That's a very interesting question because no one knows, no one actually knows the population of Kibra. So a lot of people have been coming up with their numbers. Uh, the government says it's, uh, from the census they did way back, uh, it said we are 190,000. But different organizations have also come up with their figures, uh, some as high as 2 million. But if you ask me, I would say we are around 500,000. Yeah, so people say different figures depending on uh, their interest. Government would want Kibera, Kibera's population to be smaller so that because it's opposition stronghold and so they, they don't want it to appear that, oh, we have so very many people in Kibera that can vote against us, so they want the figure to be low. Some NGOs want it to be high so that they get bigger funding to say that we are dealing with a large number of people. So it depends on who you ask. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so we have been trying to track that, uh, 
but many, many, many NGOs, many organizations, and even the government officials come for our maps. Um, it's hard to track like the, the, the Kibera community members, for example, because you don't know how they use them back home. Some would just hang them on the wall, but some would really use it uh, constructively. But for the organizations and the government officials, we've been trying to track going into their offices and asking them, uh, how has this map been useful to you? How have you used it for what reasons and stuff like this? Is it bringing any impact? For example, our security map, uh, the government took it and it was showing the safe and unsafe places. Places that were dangerous, places that would get mugged at night. And then they responded by bringing uh, security lights. Now you would find a, sec a very big security light or even a police post uh, in those areas we marked as ins insecure. So that has been a big change for us and we are happy that at least the government responded uh, to do something about it. Yes, you had a question? Yes, so um, we may not have the exact number of how many houses. It's, it's an informal settlement and therefore it's very crowded and not very organized. But uh, I know we've been mapping like satellite imagery of those houses, doing remote mapping of just trying to draw where the houses are and how they are all lined up together and scattered anyhow in a very disorganized manner. But uh, the government is trying to do something about it because uh, being an informal settlement, they've been trying to ignore it and just don't want to talk about it. But after mapping it and showing that this is what we have, this is what where people live, and there are a lot of things going on and these are citizens, I think the government is now trying to accommodate it by even uh, coming up with projects like slum upgrading. Because even at first, the government didn't want to bring services like electricity, water, and stuff. But after mapping it and highlighting it and having people speak about it every time, and it's always in the news, and Kibera is doing this and that, and you know, so now they are finding it, uh, and they're finding a need to, to recognize it, and they're trying to bring slum upgrading pro program that will now upgrade it into a better living environment. So. Again, we are happy with that. Yeah. Do we have another question? Okay, if not, thank you. <laughs>